Do I? No, no, no. I could. I'll just start. Good afternoon, everyone. Please find your seats. Thank you um, for the amazing panel that we had. It's it's very emotional to be on the receiving side of the stories that we heard. Um, I'm sure that for all of us, it just raised so many memories of the pandemic and how we lived through it. So thank you so much. It was very emotional. Uh, but good afternoon and welcome everyone to uh, the 2023 AMC Art Curators Conference. I'm E. Carmen Ramos, Chief Curatorial and Conservation Officer at the National Gallery of Art and a trustee at the AMC. Um, it feels very special to be together in a room, um, so I'm really excited about that. Thank you all for being here and a warm welcome to our online participants. I'm delighted to introduce today's panel discussion on Latinx art in New York, moderated by my dear colleague, Diana Caragol, curator of painting, sculpture, and Latinx art and history at Smithsonian's National Portrait Gallery. This panel brings together scholars, curators, and funders from across different types of institutions with varied trajectories in presenting Latinx art and acknowledges the current surge of interest that is changing the field. I appreciate the specificity of today's discussion since Latinx art is a complex and multifaceted field that comprises art and artists from different generations, regions of the United States, various Latin American diasporas, and politically incorporated communities like Puerto Ricans. The importance of New York as a main node within the broad field of Latinx art cannot be underestimated not only because of the nature of New York as an art world and art market center, but also because Latin Amer Latinx communities have long shaped the culture and identity of the city since its inception as a settler colony, but especially starting in the 19th century when New York was home to Puerto Rican and uh, Cuban emigre communities. For most of its existence as a field, Latinx art has been nurtured in Latinx alternative and neighborhood-based institutions like El Museo del Barrio, Taller Boricua, the Bronx Museum of the Arts, and defunct and important institutions like Exit Art and the Museum of Contemporary Hispanic Art. In the late 1960s and early 70s, New York was the site of protests by activist groups like the Art Workers Coalition, which included Latinx participants like, like Rafael Montañez Ortiz, the founder of El Museo del Barrio. These protests and activism demanded Latinx participation in museums, which was very slow to come. Latinx communities and their allies never waited and took matters into their own hands, founding organizations and providing a platform and support for Latinx and Latin American artists and audiences. This city also harbors a complex and changing dynamic between Latinx and Latin American art. While the 1970s and early 80s was an active period of interaction, the subsequent and increasing acceptance of Latin American art at cultural institutions and in the market has historically placed Latin American, Latinx art and artists in a subordinate position. The rising visibility of Latinx art and artists is the result of many factors, including a, nurture, a maturing generation of curators and scholars who have investigated the specificity of Latinx art, the development of important exhibitions and initiative at museums outside of New York in places like California and Washington DC that have explored the relationship between Latinx art and, and the US cultural context in which it has emerged, and the financial support of foundations like Ford, Mellon, and Getty, who have prioritized Latinx art as a field in and of itself. There's a lot of nuance to this history um, and current dynamics, which I hope today's panelists will illuminate. To explore how several New York City institutions are navigating the present moment and centering the ideas and practices of Latinx artists, Taina is joined by Beverly Adams, Essayist Abrodsky, Curator of Latin American Art at the Museum of Modern Art, Procillo Aranda Alvarado, Senior Program Officer for Creativity and Free Expression at the Ford Foundation, Marcela Guerrero, Di Martini, family curator at the Whitney Museum of American Art, and Rodrigo Maura, chief curator at El Museo del Barrio. So without further ado, I welcome the panelists to the stage.
Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's so wonderful to be here. Um, and I am so happy to be here with my dear colleagues. Uh, thank you so much, Carmen, for your wonderful introduction. Um, I am absolutely fascinated about the role that institutions play in shaping knowledge about art, in shaping the art canon, of course. And so, um, as Carmen just said, we are at a moment of uh, a shift in paradigm uh, as it concerns the appreciation um, of Latinx art nationally. And it's just, um, I'm really honored to be with colleagues who are, who are making that moment happen, who are supporting it, and uh, to be having this conversation. It's a very fruitful time to have it. Um, and I trust that this time it will be sustainable. Um, so I have asked uh, each one of my colleagues here um, to just to ground, in order to ground this conversation, to do a very brief show and tell about a recent exhibition or acquisition highlighting Latinx art at their museum and to describe the project, uh, what it achieved within the framework of their institutions and of the field of Latinx art or American art uh, or modern and contemporary art, depending on, on which context they presented it. Um, so if we, let's go to the PowerPoint. Okay, wonderful. If we could start with, with Marcela. Great. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here on a Sunday, on a beautiful Sunday. Um, and thank you, Taina, for inviting me and, and my fellow panelists. Um, yeah, when you presented this prompt to bring uh, an exhibition or an acquisition, um, I guess the easiest thing would have been to talk about um, an exhibition that I curated that just closed two weeks ago, No Existe Mundo Post Huracan. Um, but instead, I, I, I thought of bringing, talking about this work, but and I say that it would have been easy because obviously, uh, or not obviously necessarily, but the exhibition got, garnered a lot of attention and it was great. And um, specifically thinking of acquisitions um, come stemming from that exhibition, um, I couldn't choose one because we are in the process of bringing into the collection. Um, right now we're at 17 of the 20 artists that were in the show. Um, we're still, uh, and those are in different stages of the acquisition process. You all know what I mean by that. Um, so, you know, some, a few have been ratified by the board, but the other ones are in, in different stages. Um, so I couldn't choose one of those. And, and, and I would, you know, you, you might be curious why 17, not the other three, the, the other three were artists who, uh, have more ephemeral work. So we're trying to figure out what is the right thing because we do want to bring them into the collection, just trying to identify the right work. But um, instead, I wanted to talk about this work because it's one of the most recent ones, along with two others from No Existe, that were ratified or, or works by Latinx artists who weren't in the collection, who were just ratified in our, um, our board meeting that happened in March. And um, Virginia Jaramillo, who's an artist uh, that I hopefully some of you or most of you will be familiar with and shout out to Erin um, Jidzik, who is curating a show of her work at the Kemper that opens in June. Um, but Virginia is an artist who, um, you know, this is a, a work from 1967. She had been in a Whitney annual exhibition and I, I decided to bring this and talk about it, this work because I think it touches on some of the other questions that you um, posed to us, Taina. Um, but yeah, so Virginia had been in a Whitney annual in 1972, uh, but we didn't acquire her work back then. And so it took how many five decades for the work and for her to come into the collection. Um, it's a work from 1967, um, right around the period when she moved to New York City. This also, this is a seminal work. It, it, um, it precedes the curvilinear period. So it's an astounding work um, and, you know, it's kind of regrettable, but at the same time, we're proud that the, the work came into the collection, but it took a some time and, and you know, I don't want to take too much time, but you can see also from the credit line that it's, you know, an acquisition by uh, the uh, painting and sculpture committee, but also a private or a private collector or a donor. Um, so we can talk about that later. Um, but it's a it's a work that uh, that it's 
it, it came into the collection, and so the hope is, um, as many of your museums probably, you know, you are familiar and, and, and work this way. In our case of the Whitney, we we bring we have exhibitions and most of those work, not most of the works, but we try to collect from exhibitions, right? So that is one direction. We show works and hopefully we try to bring those works and those artists into the collection or we acquire works and then we try to uh, present them in shows of the permanent collection or, or some other shows at the Whitney. So hopefully this work just came um, and, and now it's the task of thinking, you know, what is the proper context um, in which uh, upcoming permanent collection show, can we show it? And, and so we're at that stage. Fantastic, thank you so much, Marcela. Um, so much to touch upon there for the rest of the conversation. Um, Beverly, could we hear from you, please? Sure. Okay, so you wanna, all right. So thank you all, thank you for having me. And I mean, I feel like I could have given that same thing. I mean, this idea that, you know, you show things, they're good enough to show, but they're not good enough to acquire is something that, you know, we see again and again and again. So well done. <laughs> um, um, so uh, the acquisition that I wanted to uh, put forth today is uh, Pepon Osorio's Badge of Honor from 1995. It was acquired right in the middle of the pandemic in 2020. It was my first acquisition at the museum. I started in 2019. And as many of you know, it's a really moving video installation which takes on the painful issues of mass incarceration from the point of view of a son grappling with the absence of his father. And in not just my opinion, but I think of Nafil, it's nothing short of an icon because it's as relevant today as it was when it was made in 95. Um, within the framework of the institution, I think it did a lot of things. It was put on view quickly, like for MoMA quickly, like a year after it was purchased. Um, so that was in 2021. And it was it, uh, it was put on the fifth floor, which many of you know is where we show our permanent collection. But the earliest part, MoMA clings to the chronology, which is another topic we could have, but um, not maybe not today. Uh, and so that's where we show works from the 1880s to 1940s. And here was Pepon's badge of honor right between the surrealist object in Paris in the 1920s. And what I think that, did, and it was up at the same time that Guadalupe Maravilla was on the second floor in our, in our collection galleries. And so I think it did two things. It functioned as an important intervention and kind of a disruption in the museum's narrative, but it also created this genealogy from, because I, I mean, I, I don't know how you all feel about this, but I think that you really can't have Guadalupe Maravilla without Pepon. I mean, there's certain like founders in um, in in the Latinx art that you know maybe aren't getting as much attention as you know the contemporary work. So like Jaramillo and others. And for MoMA, I think it's really important that since we've missed so much of this, to have these important works that show lineages, show genealogies, show these connections, and to have them exist in all time periods throughout the museum. So it's not just like, oh, we're buying these contemporary things and it's fine now. And not, I feel like, same with Latin America, which is my specialty. Like we need to look to the past and make sure that we have anchors or pillars or however you want to call them there. The second thing is that the acquisition followed Marking Time at PS1, the amazing show by Nicole Fleetwood um, about mass incarceration. And I really think that acquiring the work affirmed, you know, the importance, importance of this issue to the museum, um, adding works from the show and the Osorio to the permanent collection um, means that they're there forever. And it's just what you're saying. It's like, you have to acquire these works because you have to take care of them forever. And there, you have to grapple with them and deal with them and figure out how to display them, not just show them for three months and move on. So to me, that was an important thing. Um, and I already talked about how it's important historically, um, but one other thing is that it showed MoMA, which, you know, so, oh, I'll behave, but um, it showed MoMA that, these amazing works are still available. Like one of the things is that, oh, well, we missed the boat. There's really not much we can do about this. We'll focus on some doing better in the future. And 
you know, I was astounded when I found out this work was available. And it was a, it was a woman who was doing a fellowship who was writing her master's thesis. Who's like, Beverly, you know, this is this work. You could buy this work. And I'm like, Oh my God, we're going to buy this work. You know? Um, But we had to find private funding. We didn't find funding from within the institution. We had to find funding from without, which is another issue we can talk about later, but um, I'll, I'll, I'll pass the mic. Thank you very much, Beverly. Well, this is already such a, an incredibly rich conversation, and it's really setting up the stage for the next questions. Rodrigo. Hi. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's great to be here. Such an honor in such a wonderful company. Thanks for the invitation. Um, so I decided to show a slide of a piece that recently entered El Museo's um, collection. Um, I've been chief curator of Museo for, I think, now four plus years. And one of the um, uh, focus we've been giving to, you know, the curatorial vision at El Museo is to really uh, work with with uh, with the permanent collection and um, uh, both uh, showing it and anchoring a number of shows around it, but also growing it. Uh, so thinking of new strategies and new priorities on how to grow. Uh, it so um, I chose this piece specifically by Carolina Caicedo, a Colombian-born, uh, actually a UK-born Colombian family raised in Colombia, lived in Puerto Rico, now live in California for a number of years in LA. And um, this is a piece called Mujeres in Me, Muxeres in Me, uh, Women in Me. Uh, that's part of a you know larger series of quilts that she does in collaborations with friends and family, appropriating from uh, uh, worn clothes and uh, sewing it together. It's also a, a wearable sculpture that can be performed. So, uh, but also there's this list of like a pantheon or genealogy of uh, women artists uh, that are important to, um, to, to Carolina. And this uh, particular piece is gonna be in the center of a room of our uh, upcoming, uh, permanent collection shows something beautiful, reframing la collection that opens actually uh, next week on the 18th, so of May. So everybody's uh, welcome uh, to join us. Um, and as such, this this piece is in the center of a room where we have uh, works by uh, different uh, women artists, especially dealing with abstraction uh, in their in their trajectories and uh, with a uh, with a strong uh, pioneering role. Uh, and this show, something we can, you know, talk about uh, in a minute on how this show is, uh, is, has been a, like a really important, um, almost um, um, f uh, culmination of a long process of reinterpreting you being one of the, you know, colleagues who have, you know, worked with us in the different uh, meetings and uh, others. Uh, to really rethink uh, the, the collection and its uh, reinterpretation. But in the show uh, that the, this uh, that opens next week, um, this piece plays a, an important role uh, almost as um, almost as a wish list. So uh, there's a number of artists that are uh, written it. Uh, in in the in the in the piece, Fanny Sani is one of them. Fanny is in the room with this wonderful sculpture. A lot of them are not. So we see Noemi Perez, Janira da Motti Silva, uh, Judy Baca, and several others. So this uh, serves as almost as a uh, um, a wish list, and um, yeah, I guess like a. Uh, to think positive about the future and the growth of Elmo Sales collection. So I'll, I'll leave it there, but uh, we can continue talking about Elmo Sales uh, permanent collection and the role uh, we've been all giving to it in our curatorial vision. Thank you. Beautiful. So we've talked about foundational figures, about how to establish and bring them back. We've talked about moments of exposure that go away and the museums have caught up much later on about great opportunity. Rocio, you're wearing two hats in this conversation as a former curator and as, uh, well, I think, I, I don't want to say a former curator, but you're mainly in the philanthropy world now. Um, I don't want to say former because I, I, I love your curating and I, I want to see it continue, but <laughs> can you speak to uh, the role that you've been playing as a, in the Ford Foundation uh, in making this moment sustainable? 
Thank you. Thank you, Taina, for the invitation to be here. And um, I'm so honored to be among all these amazing folks. Um, you know, one of the things we talk about when we want to create positive change, um, how do we get work by Latinx artists into museum collections? It's one of the things we want to work on, right? There's many things that contribute to the state we're in, which is inequality including, you know, there's several things that the foundation works on um, in order to change the systems of inequality. And the two that I think are most relevant to arts and culture are ac unequal access to the economy and entrenched cultural narratives. Um, and so the two things that I thought I could do when I got into philanthropy um, was number one, bring attention to artists. And number two, to make space for curators and creating opportunities, especially for those of us that have been excluded from positions of intellectual leadership. So in partnership with Mellon Foundation, I'm so grateful actually to my colleague, Deborah Cullen, who's been really um, a thought partner in this work. Um, in partnership with Mellon Foundation, we created the Latinx Artist Fellowship Program that will develop over five years, awarding 15 artists unrestricted grants of $50,000 each. This work is led by the U.S. Latinx Art Forum and is supported by the New York Foundation for the Arts. And I want to underscore how grateful we are to them for their commitment to this initiative and to their deep dedication to these artists. Um, Uslef is in the third year of leading this program, and here I'm showing you the group of artists awardees from the first two years. It's truly an amazing roster of intergenerational Latinx talent. So um, I do get people asking, you know, like, if it's not our area of expertise, how do we bring these artists into the collection? And so this is a great place to start. All of these artists are a great um, addition to any collection because they're part of the history of American art and contemporary art globally. Um, each year through the diligence of USLAF, the artists are selected by USLAF's partners in this work from El Museo del Barrio, LACMA, the Mexican Museum of Fine Art, Mexicarte Museum, MFA Houston, and the Whitney Museum, and other field experts, including fellowship artists from previous years. And then the second part of this work is just beginning. About a month ago, we announced um, the Advancing Latinx Art in Museums initiative a partnership among 10 museums and four funders, Ford, Mellon, Getty, and Terra Foundations. I'm grateful to everyone whom, who has been a partner in this work. This initiative creates positions also to be supported over five years on curatorial teams for expertise in U.S. Latinx art. And then just earlier this week, um, we announced a second initiative in partnership with 19 museums and four funders, Ford Mellon, Walton Family Foundation, and Barbara and Amos Hostetter through their Pilot House Philanthropy. We're so grateful to be able to do this work in this company, and this will support positions, again, of intellectual leadership, not only in curatorial, um, at 19 museums across the country. And that is just a <laughs> incredible news, really. and and. Congratulations to you and thank you. Thank you to you, to Deborah Collin, to the to the foundations that are partnering together to work and make um, these changes really uh, something that is not just of this moment, but that lasts. Uh, they're transformative changes really for the field. Um, Beverly and Marcela, you touched upon this uh, in the first questions, but uh, first question, but I wanted you to to speak a little bit more about the specific frameworks and contexts in which you get to carve out a space for Latinx art, uh, being that uh, the in relation to modern and contemporary art for you, Beverly, and uh, of American art, be that being that national or hemispheric. Uh, Marcela, could we could we talk a little bit about that, Beverly? Maybe you could speak first. Sure. Um, first of all, forgive me for my coughing fit. Uh, <laughs> so sorry to interrupt. Um, you know, carve out is a strong word. And um, I think I think there's been some changes in the museum. Um, staff always changes. There's been um, DEAI initiatives. There's been a recognition of <coughs> Excuse me. How? 
Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, yeah, so in the case of the Whitney, we are, yeah, uh, National Museum's art from the US. Um, it's a, a museum founded in brief, super brief history of <laughs> the Whitney, uh, founded, in 19, uh, founded in 1930 by Gertrude Vanderbilt well, Whitney. Um, so I just say that because it's very much a top of mind that the museum is about to turn 100 and how fast uh, things have um, uh, changed in the recent past and just to add more context in that uh, regard of how things have, um, or the landscape at least in the Whitney has changed, um, it's in part because uh, I give a lot of kudos and and, and really a, a, bit, a huge thanks to Rita Gonzalez, who when the museum was moving from its uh, um, main building, the Boyer building to, or what used to be the Boyer building, um, uh, or the museum at the Boyer building, to the meatpacking district, um, the museum hired a couple of scholars and curators to make an assessment of the collection in specific areas. And Rita Gonzalez, curator at LACMA, um, did that for the Whitney. So when I started in 2017, that really provided me uh, uh, a good uh, um, blueprint of what it was that I was working with, or and the huge gaps, um, the, the the different trends. You know, for example, from seventy one to nineteen ninety one, no Latinx artists enter the collection because I think I've said this in many um, other webinars and and presentations. Um, the director at the time, Thomas Armstrong, Armstrong. Um, then uh, on, the only way in which you could come into the co collection was through the exhibition program and only citizens could come into the collection. Um, so my I've, I've surmised, um, I don't have evidence quite uh, yet, um, that because of perhaps, I don't know, the surname of uh, Latinx artists, it was assumed that they were foreigners or something like that. Um, that is so anyway that we're talking about a 20 year gap you know that many artists were showing in new york to carmen's uh point about mocha about i mean obviously el museo um right when it was starting you know so many so that's the work that 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 we're trying to do um and so obviously uh in this new landscape what do you need you need curators with expertise um things that have you know, I did an exhibition in 2019 that uh, uh, now compared to the exhibition that I did just recently in 2022-23, it's night and day, you know. Um, Scott Rothkopf also to the, his credit, who um, he hired me, uh, current chief curator, he realized when we were starting to work together that it wasn't just curating exhibitions and bringing works into the collection. Obviously, that's crucial in a museum, but he realized that, you know, there are so many other departments that are working together with you. And if they don't know, if they, we, you don't have the, their buy-in, if they don't know what they're working towards, what the final goal or the goal is, um, it's going to be a, a, a steep hill. Um, so we've been, you know, in these past five, six years, kind of socializing the idea among departments. And it's a radically different uh, Whitney than the one that I started with uh, or started in 2017. And imagine 1930. <laughs> um, so now we're talking about uh, that we have a director of education, Chris Corsa, um, who is, uh, you know, really changing um, the face of the museum, uh, making it bilingual and bicultural. Um, we have virtually a, 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 a or more Latinx people in the different departments of the museum, meaning that they bring uh, their interests, their background, their language skills, if they have them and they want to share them. Um, that is really crucial and essential. Um, and then let me see if I wanted to make one last point. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's not enough to have um, the expertise. You really need to build and um, you know, it's a, um, 
a holistic view of what you want to do, what you, you're working towards um, at an institutional level, not at a single individual um, curatorial level, which, you know, and I, I, I really give thanks to what the um, the Ford and the Mellon and the USLAF ha have been doing because they're really, they understand the ecosystem and trying to ameliorate those, uh, uh, you know, gaps and, and um, uh, you know, yeah, areas that we've been underperforming, yeah. Wonderful, thank you. Beverly? I'm gonna, <clears throat> I'll try again. <laughs> thank you for your patience with my voice and my coughing. Um, you know, MoMA front of house has mixed media, finally, right? When did that happen? 2019. So we have photography and film and drawings and prints and design and painting and sculpture all mixed up in the galleries. We were kind of late to that. Um, but back of house is still very much ordered by media. And the idea of an area specialist is a very strange thing for this institution. Um, there are two area specialists, and they're both Latin Americanists, and they're there because of donors' insistence, because there was someone with um, enough force, cough drops are falling, uh, and enough financial uh, wherewithal to insist that these positions become endowed. Um, but there are no other spoken area specialists. So speaking of socializing, you know, what's needed, I spend a lot of time talking to colleagues in drawing some prints and photography and film. And when I had a um, had the opportunity to have an MRC fellow that was a specialist in Latinx art, I said, please help me figure out what we have, what we don't have, what the programs looks like, what the history, like what happened at the Whitney is because there had never been an independent audit or digging into this material. No one had ever considered it. What had, what had landed in the museum, and we have works that were acquired in the 1940s. We do have things in the collection, but it was always catch as catch can. There was never a concerted effort to do that. and. Because of this area specialty division, they'll argue that that's the same with everything. But all of the experts are in Western European art or American art, which often translates to like what's in the most powerful New York galleries. And so it's been really interesting to see sometimes um, how something as neutral as media like a media division of a museum or something is supposedly neutral as chronology um, is exclusionary. Mm -hmm. So so when we say carving out space, I, I started before I had my coughing fit saying, okay, our staff is much more diverse than it's been in the past. There have been DEAI initiatives that have started. Um, there is a, more of a recognition that MoMA has to be somehow connected to the community here in New York. Um, there's been your work at the Ford, Mellon, Getty. There's work at U.S. universities making scholars. There's even the marketplace that have shone the light, shone, shined, I don't know, brought this, all of this, um, you know, this amazing work to the light of day, these amazing artists. But um, it's been really interesting as someone who's an advocate. I mean, I'm an advocate. I'm not. A, I'm not an expert. Um, to see like how how to maneuver in this gigantic institution and how it is that we can do things. And I have to say that, unfortunately, to be kind of blunt, that money makes things happen, and that's why there's Latin American curators at the MoMA because of Brodsky and Cisneros. Um, there was a recent spate of great uh, contemporary acquisitions of Latinx art, and that was because the Latin American and Caribbean Fund paired with Fund 21, which is a separate fund for contemporary art, and we pushed and pushed and pushed for both Latin American and Latinx art. Um, private funding helped with my Pipo and Osorio acquisition. So 
one of the things I think that is still missing is for more traditional institutions that haven't, you know, really made this an important um, goal is to have outside pressure and to have access to funders and collectors and um, that kind of support. But, you know, it's MoMA. Like, who wants to give MoMA money to buy art? Do you know anybody? <laughs> no, nobody wants to give money to MoMA to buy art. So it, it's it's been an interesting challenge. And, and we have made successes. We have bought things. We have shown things. There is a lot of uh, support from other colleagues at the institution. It's going to happen. It's just not going to be like a straight line, you know, and it's not going to be, um, but it, it, because I do think we need to focus on historical things. Uh, I do think it'll move forward and we will make more and more space. But what was the, I don't know if, if you all read the reviews of MoMA when it reopened after the expansion, the one thing that people signaled over and over again was there was no Latinx art institution. So, mm -hmm. you know, this is a, a recent kind of development and change it is it is and I, and I love that you both um, acknowledge um, well the problems of you know how certain criteria can be are supposedly universal or uh, level the field like chronology like uh, and some others not, and some others end up being so exclusionary yes um, uh, Rodrigo um, and also Rocio uh, could you speak about the the joys and the frustrations of doing and the challenges of doing the foundational work the foundational work that that then that creates a field and that uh eventually self serves as inspiration for for larger institutions to follow that lead i have three really quick things and then i'd love to chat with rodrigo um the advantage of doing this work early on, number one, was no one questioned our suggestion at El Museo that Filipinx are also Latinx. And this was in one of our biennials, um, the S-Files, which has been such a crucial show, I think, in launching the careers of so many younger Latinx artists and actually multi-generational, you know, artists who hadn't gotten the attention they deserved, who were included in the exhibition for the first time and then sometimes came into the museum's collection. Um, you know, it started because we were doing research on artists. We needed more women artists in the show, and we found one artist, and then it turned out she was born in Manila. <laughs> and then we thought, well, why should we exclude it? It's got a similar history, right? We're talking about groups that also shared, in many cases, um, the same barrio in San Diego, for example, right? Number two, it's been so gratifying, I think, to give our artists an early start in their career and to see them soar. And there's so many examples, even more than the the faces I showed you earlier. Um, I forgot to say that there's a third year of fellows coming out literally in two weeks. Very exciting. We're all sworn to secrecy, so we can't tell, but a fantastic group. And then third, I found ways to buy works even when there was literally no acquisitions money. And sometimes when it was just, I was asked to be a juror on something and they were gonna pay me a little something or put that into an acquisitions budget, which actually curators at the National Museum of the American Indian were doing also, um, believe it or not. So even at the Smithsonian, there's sometimes you have to go around in order to get money to buy the things you want. Thank you. Yeah, no, this is so interesting, Rocio. And I wanna just, you know, start my answer to your question by, uh, touching on some of the you know topics you raised in your in your in your response, starting with the uh, the famous uh, how's it called um, curatorial discretionary fund that should be called the Rocio uh, the Rocio Aranda Alvarado fund, and um, and I really commend you for that, and I, you know, and on on an institutional behalf here. Because uh, now that we you know, as I mentioned before, we're curating this tour de force exhibition of the permanent collection. We came across with like really important works like Perla de Leon's photographs. Uh, Jaime Permuth, was that you too? <laughs> uh, that came to to the collection through your uh, abnegation, you know, to your um, generosity. So I wanna just wanna mention that again and. Um, uh, also, the, the, 
like the the, the Filipino uh, mentioned, um, I think this is also so important not to think of El Museo as a, like a place to, as an institution to think of diaspora. You know, not not only, I mean, of course, having the Latino diaspora as the main lenses and as the main focus, but just to think of diaspora and colonial historicities shared as your show is now uh you know touching on on a from a historical perspective in the uh, in, in washington uh in terms of like joys and frustrations um that's uh the roller coaster day of uh, curatorial work right uh, a lot of joys a lot of frustrations uh sometimes they're even the same thing um <laughs> right <laughs> Yeah, but I'm. I mean, I want to just use this as an excuse to talk about the the curatorial program or the curatorial vision that we've been working with El Museo. Uh, uh, you know, Carmen Ramos, she uh, really beautifully introduced this panel by uh, uh, bringing forward a lot of the foundational histories of Latinos in New York, which is uh, the topic of the discussion today. And El Museo is obviously. Uh, the institutional project. No, that I remember, you know, the beloved Hiram Maristani telling me, "Oh, this place was misnamed. No, this was misnamed. It was never meant to be a museum." And this is so beautiful, actually. No, this this idea uh, that Rafael and his peers, and you know, the artists with the Tayer Boricua and several others, they created a museum where there was. Uh, there was a call for uh, institution uh, for academic curriculum. No, so th this was the call, and they turned it into a museum. So this is, I mean, a lot of the joy of it is really to reinstate that history. You know, to make sure that history is available for the successive generations of museum goers and audiences and peers and uh, other curators and researchers uh, because that's a story that uh, history that if El Museo doesn't tell no one else will tell for us so that's really important and I you know I strongly had put this in the center of my program when I started so I there's a number of like uh, shows the Tayar Boricua show in 2019 or 20 that was the show that uh, inaugurated uh, my program there that I curated, uh, looking at the you know, 70s period, early 80s period of Tayer Boricua, and then the Rafael Montañez Ortiz show, uh, uh, Contextual retrospect Retrospective, that I co curated with Julieta Gonzalez, um, um, that, you know, uh, also first major. Uh, a museum survey uh, or retrospective of Rafael in several decades, uh, like an artist with like a paramount contribution to contemporary art globally, not only in the US, but internationally. Uh, so the Enfoco exhibition that I curated with uh, uh, Susanna Temkin in 2021, uh, looking at the uh, Bronx-based uh, photography collective and a seminal um, uh, donation of theirs to El Museo in the 1970s and so many more. Um, and now the collection shows something beautiful, reframing like collection, where we're also looking at the you know history of El Museo through the lenses of its acquisitions, donations. You see that like the generosity of artists have been you know really really important to the formation of that of the collection so many important artist gifts over the years uh and this is you know something not to be remiss about because it's really really central uh so we you know as El Museo this is something we can develop in another um moment in the talk we don't have you know deep pocketed patrons so many of them we have a few that are very devoted and very committed but we don't have you know the same kind of you know basis of uh patrons that other more established more uh, mainstream museums have and that's really important to understand how uh you know what can be achieved in terms of collecting and what cannot be achieved but having said that i don't think we should 
uh, the, the, you know, the piece I showed before by Carolina, I forgot to mention the, its credit line was a gift of the acquisitions committee. Uh, that is a small group uh, of very uh, committed uh, young patrons who have been helping us with like very key acquisitions, especially uh, areas where the museum uh, had not prioritized in the past, like uh, 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 women artists, uh, not so much. There have been, you know, important gifts over the years, uh, but uh, trans, queer, and non-binary voices, uh, Afro-Latinx uh, artists, and indigenous artists. So all these are, you know, foci that we're trying to develop uh, to develop through these new uh, acquisitions funds. Um, yeah. So this is. I mean, I think I'm talking about more the joys than the frustrations, but I, you know, I kind of mentioned the frustrations indirectly too. <laughs> you did. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I I have to say that as as a curator in the field too, it is the availability of some works, as you said at the beginning, Beverly. In terms of um, you know, Pepon's work, Pepon's installation being still available so many years after its creation, that's that's a wonderful opportunity. It's also frustrating. It's like what? Yeah. And so, well, let's talk about talking about the market. Um, have you? How has this increased interest in Latinx art? Um, are you seeing the impact of it in what is available or not right now for your institutions, for you to acquire as curators? You know, I can think of the model of of a contemporary African American art, for example. You know, some. Um, artists, I think in the last decade, we've all seen uh, the wonderful explosion in visibility of Afri African-American contemporary art and, and art by contemporary Black artists in general. In portraiture, it's very, very apparent. And there are some artists that the museum could afford uh, their work five years ago and not anymore. My museum, for example, the National Portrait Gallery. So I wonder if you're seeing some of those um, trends to for Latinx art or not yet or I mean I'll say the the fact that that credit line had an uh, another person not just the museum I think it points to how even museums like mine are being priced out or you know our, our it's it's prices are getting up there so I can't imagine what it is or I was thinking on my way here I thought, oh, well, if this is for the Whitney, then how is it for Emilso? But in fact, it might be that um, because you were there first, you might have those artists in your collection. It's and interesting that, we, you know, we're talking about Virginia Jaramillo, who's an artist that I absolutely adore. And um, we do have a couple of prints uh, from the 70s by Virginia. Um, but um, we don't have an oil. And uh, in this, you know, something beautiful in this upcoming show, uh, I'm, we're including a number of, um, as Susanna very smartly calls them, and that aspirational loans. Or, <laughs> and we do have a fantastic painting by Virginia that is actually already hanging in the galleries, but much later. Um, so maybe we need your friend's phone. <laughs> uh, but yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, Jaramillo is a perfect example. I mean, yeah. Um, I think also there's something else about the market too. There's these some artists that haven't had a market at all and are now being shown, and there's no comps, and they're they're sort of making up for uh, you know decades of not being supported by the market, and so the prices are high because they make sense within the context of the art market right now, but there's no way to like justify them to your committee. So I'm like, well, this is, you know, several hundred thousand dollars. And they're like, well, show me why. And it's really hard to do that. And so, but I think these artists need to be supported. And I think that their work is worth the amount, but it, it's, um, it's just sort of another, as the flip side, it's not just being priced up. It's like there's this, because the market was non-existent and then all of a sudden we're seeing this blip, there's there's a bunch of irregular uh, irregularities. Not That's not the right word, but it's just, um, it's complex to be able 
not only to fundraise for things, but also to like, you, there's no auction comps. There's no ways that we normally do when we have to like go to our boss and say, this mm -hmm. costs X and, you know, so I just think it's another part. Of, I mean, if I do Definitely. think they're, they're worth it, it's yeah. just a strange part of the. Market. Yes, it's, it's, that's a, that's an, an excellent comment. Yeah, it's absolutely true. I, and, and I think uh, we've probably been in that situation, um, many of us, yes. And needless to say, the labor of, you know, feeling that it's slightly offensive <laughs> to yes. be questioned yes. why the prices and yeah. the extra labor that other people are not asked to do. That's yeah, but I'll, I'll, I'll add something to this and you know, along the lines of what Beverly was saying, that at times you really need to have like a market structure in place for an artist to justify a price and that, you know, you almost have to create the contradiction for yourself because, um, because I think patrons will follow that in most cases, right? Private patrons will will follow uh, prices that are, you know, anchored on on the market level, and if there's the generosity to give these works to the museum, that's a second question. But you know, I I just feel that this is something I really notice starting to work in this field. Just like a very quick side note. I don't come from American art. I come from Brazil. I, you know, used to work in a different uh, structure, uh, and how little representation of Latinx arts artists there were in galleries, especially mainstream galleries, especially of interesting, really, really interesting artists. Mm -hmm. You know, you look at these slides. I keep saying this. Your slide. It's like it's amazing. Probably a lot of these artists didn't have galleries or you know at the time they were receiving the prizes or they didn't have galleries for decades yeah. and this is this is somehow difficult when you're like looking at private funding to support acquisitions you know i'm just like touching on something that is a little uh, painful but so i i do believe that uh there should a lot be said about fund, foundations funding for to 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 support acquisitions, you know, and to support uh, so to make sure that this uh, our history is uh, secured in the in the collections of museums, because um, it's it's not easy always. It is, it is not. Okay, to bring this full circle before we go to um, questions and answers, um, I. Uh, well, thinking about how uh, Carmen set the stage for the conversation and uh, and the very title of this of this panel um, and the foundational role that New York has had in creating a space for uh, Latin American and Latinx art in in the cultural landscape of this uh, country. Can you, how do you envision that, you know, as we are having, as we're living through this moment um, and, and all of us are sitting here from very different institutional perspectives, um, what do you think is the role of New York now in the larger ecosystem of uh, American and Latinx art? It's like a. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would like just to, you know, continue on the same vein of like bringing examples of, you know, projects that we've been working on. Um, uh, Rocio mentioned the, the S files, you know, such an important platform over the years. Uh, I think started in 2000, if I'm not, if not 99. 99, yeah. So the 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 the, the, the S files is, was a series of exhibitions between 99 and I think 2013. Uh, was also known as El Museo's Biennial. Uh, it was a show uh, was showcase of uh, Latin act artists based in New York City. And this is also an ex uh, a series of exhibitions that we revisited and would kind of spin off. Uh, with a Tria Now series that took place first in 2020, 2021. Uh, and the, 
you know, the big change in format uh, that we implemented was uh, to make it a, nation, a national uh, survey uh, of Latinx artists practicing. And that, I mean, this is something that I think is very interesting because, I mean, of course, we're talking about New York now, but also New York as a vitrine, you know, for uh, as a... Uh, how many artists did we visit in the process of curating that show? And we still do, and they're very excited about showing with El Museo and showing uh, in New York with El Museo and having their debut with uh, with El Museo in New York. So I'd say that there's also this role of, you know, New York being a very high visibility place for uh, Latinx art. And I think El Museo's, uh, you know, vision now is that we really want to, you know, give this, you know, nationwide platform and uh, have, uh, you know, more complex and more um, dynamic dialogues between the artists. And I think that's, you know, something we can really contribute with. I'll just add, um, I think it, it's, um, it, it's not lost on me that I, New York legitimizes artists and I don't think we should be shy about saying that I think that's very very true but as or at least from my perspective as a curator with a um, expertise in Latinx art it is I feel it like it's my responsibility and it's incumbent upon me that I look elsewhere like not just in New York and that there are many other institutions across the nation who are legitimizing and presenting and taking that first chance on artists outside of New York. And so even um, with, uh, I was talking to my chief curator about the discretionary funds and I can't believe we've used the phrase discretionary funds twice in a panel, um, <laughs> but something as obvious as, okay. So two, two different meanings. In two different meanings, yeah, uh, for travel. Um, and uh, how I feel like I was stating the obvious, but I needed to say it, that I need to travel to other cities to see art because Latinx art is not only in New York and which it's not only obvious because of what I do, but also because as a museum of, the US, um, we all should be traveling to many places outside of New York. And not that he was against it, just t stating the obvious, like this money I will use and I need it because I need to go to these different exhibitions and these different cities to do studio visits and blah, 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 blah. Um, so, so just to, you know, be cognizant of the, the role that we occupied and that we, you know, it, 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 New York does occupy a very important um, space in that ecosystem of uh, Latinx art, um, but we should leverage that for artists who are outside of New York. Can I just say thank you? As someone who worked in the Southwest for a very long time, you know, I worked in Texas, I went to school in Texas, I worked in Arizona where there was all these amazing artists who had no traction at all or these museums that were doing incredible things. And then the Whitney now says, oh, yeah, we know who Luis Jimenez is. We're like, really? <laughs> well, congratulations. Thank you for I knew because of my work in Houston. You know what I mean? No, I'm not saying you. I'm not talking about you. It's like an ex-director who said that a long time ago. Oh, yes yeah. history there yeah that was history my point is is that um a lot of these institutions and and people working in you know uh other states in the u.s do see and understand the legit legitimizing function of new york city um so it's great that you're meeting them halfway or that people are going you know like the s files and including you know people outside of new york and, and traveling and to see work everywhere um and you know but like the only reason i was able to to buy joey terrell is because it was at our true store projects and i could show that's another one of the rules and acquisitions is that to be able to see it in person so yeah, and the reason the or to Zara saw the work is because we should. Because it was at El Museo. Museo. Yeah. So, you know, so that, I mean, the having works of art in New York galleries makes it easier for New York institutions that have a, a thornier path to that. It makes it more accessible. It already legitimizes it. Um, so we need people, S-Files, are you traveling to see all these things to bring them here so that 
it makes it easier for, you, for me <laughs> because it's hard <laughs> i'll just say something really quick about yeah. data about data you know new york city 30 percent of new yorkers are latinx Almost 50% of people in Los Angeles are Latinx. All throughout the Southwest, especially the border cities, are 80 and 90% Latinx. Um, we talk about, uh, you know, funders especially are focusing on the American South um, and Native American communities and also what they're calling the heartland. And so when you think about the American South, it has this Latinx counterpart called El Nuevo Sur, which is where a lot of new immigrants are coming. They work in agriculture and meatpacking and um, those kinds of industries. So, you know, aquí estamos y no nos vamos. We're here and we're staying. The Latinx population is really um, growing. And I think, you know, one of the things we forget is that we're not all new immigrants. There's people who have been here for generations. The vast majority of Latinos who are born today um, are born to English dominant. Most Latinos are English dominant. You know, we're part of American culture and American art history. And so, you know, belong in these collections of American art and global art history. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have time for questions? Yeah. OK, wonderful. Thank you. Wow, what a treat. Um, do we have any questions? You could please come to the mics in the front. <laughs> Here you go. Um, hi. Um, I just have a question. Um, and this is a question because oftentimes um, I come to different events and there's not a lot of um, these kind of panels for um, African American, you know. So uh, my question is: is is there people within your organization that are doing similar things um, to acquire and present African American um, or Black American work? I know you talked about the portrait gallery and things being um, pricing and things like that. And I know a lot of times because Black Americans have a vast majority of work. And a lot of times now it seems like it's a little priced out because they've had to do things on their own for so many years um, till they couldn't wait for places like the Whitney or the Martin Art to say, hey, let me give a stamp of approval and say that your work is great and we wanna house it. Um, so a lot of times those things are priced out, but there's still a lot of other artists out there that are doing great things so within your organizations, um, is there people that are actually creating these opportunities for black artists to come into your ex uh, come in and have exhibitions? And do you I'm one of, I'm, I happen to be a curator that curates those kinds of exhibitions because I want to be able to get our work into the museums and to be seen and to be preserved just like everybody else's work like you know just different historical works and so my question is is who's doing that um for the black and african-american artists within your museums and can you give me information on them so i can present stuff to them so that they can see it and so that we can have um black work as well um you know collected and represented and hopefully one day have a really great panel that's talking about how our work is also being collected and preserved so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you know not to take away from latinx i love you guys <laughs> it's amazing but i just had that question yeah no great question i'll i'll say in the case of the whitney um the work has been going on for so many years and the hugest you know props to Thelma Golden who was curator of the Whitney and now is um, director of the Studio Museum in Harlem and she really created I'm uh, you know many many differences of course in 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 what I'm doing and and but I feel like you know I see reflections of what I'm doing and what she did and so to the point that it feels now that it's part of the fabric and and everyone at the museum has that um, vocabulary to talk about and insert uh, black artists into say the um, exhibitions about abstract expressionism or pop art or this and that and that that is almost just like second nature and and mm -hmm. there's um, everyone has kind of that expertise if you will whereas I'm 
I'm not lagging, but just like uh, coming in a little later, you know, because it was it, it, that area of the museum wasn't really uh, in Latinx art. Uh, paid attention to, but with black art and African American artists, that was already happening in the 80s and 90s. Um, so yeah, it's a great question. Um, I want to get to that place, you know. I want to get to that place where, and and I already see it happening. You know, other curators who are putting um, works by Latinx artists in their exhibition. So it's not just me. So that's that's important, and that it has, and you see it happening. You know, we have. Uh, upcoming show by Henry Taylor um, that's coming from uh, MoCA LA and that is Barbara Haskell, you know, a white curator who's uh, organizing for for the Whitney. Um, but we also have Adrian Edwards, um, great curator of performance art, um, doing a show about El Albin Ailey soon, you know, so it's happening, yeah. I think we can make the same argument from MoMA, uh, which also did a, a very um, deep dive into uh, uh, writing about and presenting its history of engagement with African American artists. Uh, there's a curator in painting and sculpture who's focusing on uh, works from Africa. We have a, a curator from Nigeria in a photography department. So black art across the board is being shown with much more frequency. What we don't have is this sort of Afro Latinx and that's where things get strange because uh, there have been acquisitions of Afro-Brazilian art, um, but there, you know, there's there's this in betweenness or slipping through the cracks that continues to happen with Latinx, um, in, 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 even if it, if the artists are of Af Afro descendants. Yeah, no, this is such a great question and such a like multi-layered one. Also, I'm happy to take on. Uh, the uh, how this you know resonates in the in the in the Latinx field in El Museo's specifically uh, by saying that I think you know the Latinx art world the Latinx art field exists in the same world where there's you know colorism and racism in the art world at large so that has been a problem that has been an issue over time for Latin American art, for Latinx art. So I think this is something that really, you know, needs to be addressed. In El, in El Museo's history, there was a moment when that was very important. I think the museum starts with an, an anti-racist, anti-colorist mandate, you know, especially with the first directors, Marta Moreno Vega, uh, Jaime Maristani, are, are, you know, both activists and, and, and organizers and, you know, museum directors who have addressed this with their work with El Museo. But I think over time that that also becomes an issue for, for El Museo. And I think it's an issue uh, in general. So I think this is something we're like really looking at, uh, you know, exhibitions, you know, in the exhibition program uh, to, to really think uh, about Afro-Latinx artists, uh, you know, Puerto Rican diaspora, it's, uh, you know, huge uh, black uh, in it. And this is uh, something that we want to, um, you know, have shows that uh, deal directly with this, but also acquisitions. Also, I think there's something to be said about our museum that it, uh, it, it it's an institution with a Latin American collection that's not in the beginning of its mission, but it's over the years the museum opened itself uh, to to Latin American art and our history, and in that in that realm it has also been much more you know Eurocentric and and white focused. So this is something that I think also with acquisitions and uh, you know exhibitions to be announced soon. Uh, we are um, trying trying to reflect and um, and also you know these are changes that are happening in um, in in you know like countries like Brazil, but not only uh, with uh, you know new art historical scholarship uh, on uh, Afro Brazilian and Afro uh, Latinx Afro Latino artists. Thank you. Um, this is a question from our virtual attendee. Um, it says, could you speak to the experience and challenges of integrating Latinx art into larger histories slash chronologies, thinking about US American art in the Whitney and modern art at the at BOMA? Challenges? 
what, what was the um, challenges, um, experience and challenges of integrating Latinx art into larger histories slash chronologies? Um, I think I would need more context, but I, we're trying, <laughs> we're doing it. Um, and I can point, you know, uh, at examples of, of exhibition that was curated by Jenny Goldstein in the balance about um, art from our permanent collection um, of painters working kind of uh, sculptors, sculptors working kind of as painters. Um, that is a narrative in which uh, the work of Freddy Rodriguez, and it was a small show, um, was uh, part of, um, we're working towards that integration of um, of context of you know not necessarily doing exhibitions that or the that the I think we're very conscious about that that the only context in which Latinx artists can be at the Whitney is in a Latinx exhibition that that is that can happen but that's not the only way and that's not why why we are collecting art just to have them in these kind of ex. Uh, ethnically specific exhibitions. Thank you guys so much. Um, I'm very aware of our time, so I hope this is not a long response, um, but just curious if you at any of your organizations can speak to the collecting management policies you might have or the, the collecting plans this is something that my institution is just developing and I just don't know if, if you have it in place. Um, in those plans, if it's very specific that you are planning to acquire more work by uh, Latinx artists, then how that might support, like those kind of documents support that effort or hinder it, make it more red tape. So. Sure. You want to go? I can speak to the portrait gallery since I think I think we lost one panelist. <laughs> I think we already had yeah. another. Um, yeah, uh, great question. Uh, I'll say briefly, yes, we have. So the Whitney had got a grant um, before the pandemic from the Luz, um, and we did a collection strategic plan. Um, and so several, I think the the entire department worked in some capacity with the group. And but we identified many areas um, that were had been neglected, historically neglect, neglected, um, and to the previous person who asked like one of those was uh, works by black women artists um, from a very specific like early 20th century, something to that effect. Um, and Latinx art was one and a bunch of different ones. So it is literally, it's on paper, um, the history of, of how that came to happen. Um, who were the artists that we missed? Um, what are our priorities? The different price points to that, you know, wish list. So I think we're being as um, specific and um, detailed uh, and thorough as possible, hopefully. Um, and as I said, it's a kind of a, a, a work that we're all doing together um, in the department, yeah. I'm only a moderator here, but perhaps also uh, I can answer that question since I work at a museum of um, American art, or US art and history and biography. Um, at the Portrait Gallery when I arrived 10 years ago, um, we just perhaps like what Rita did at at LACMA, at, at the Whitney. We looked very, in a very concentrated way, at our collection and at its demographics. And um, at the time, we had about twenty two thousand six hundred objects, and about five percent uh, pertained to African Americans and less than 1% to Latinx people, to Asian Americans, and to Native Americans. Um, all of those three populations were less than like, less than 1%. African Americans, 5%. Women were comprised of less than a quarter of the collection. You know, think about portraiture and the the biases of portraiture itself as a as a genre, right? And the elitism of it, the gender bias. So um, our director, Kim Sayed, made it an imperative, really, to um, have any acquisition purchased thereafter. 50% uh, of them had to reflect some kind of diversity in terms of gender, in terms of uh, 
of racial or ethnic or cultural background. And that transformed, the, that has really been transformative for the institution. Um, certainly it has helped a lot to have a Latinx uh, curator. Um, if we compare it to the, to the other demographics, for sure Latinx art advanced uh, more in a faster way in this last decade than the other demographics. But still, you know, it, it sort of changed the mindset of the institution. And even though, you know, you're working against decades and decades of, you know, acquisitions, right? I mean, so moving the needle takes forever. You know, I've acquired over 200 works, you know, but still I'm not at much better than 1% <laughs> because it just takes forever to move the needle. Mm -hmm. um, you can walk through our galleries and the experience is radically different than five years ago, than 10 years ago, yes. And, and uh, the visitors say so also in the, the comment cards. And of course we do other things to make them feel welcome to like having a bilingual, fully bilingual museum since 2014. So that has helped a lot too. I think our time is over, uh, but this has been a, an incredible conversation. We only scratched the surface. So um, thank you so much, Judith Pinedo, for inviting us. Thank you, Pamela. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Like, thank you. Um, so hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our first day of sessions. 